I came straight this morning, a little bit tired, but it, is, it was a real time of refreshing, worshiping together and getting to know some more people. And uh, we are really blessed to hear the word from Pastor Jung Park, who is our guest speaker for today as well. He is the founding and lead pastor of Redemption Church in Naperville, Illinois, and he is a college friend of mine. We uh, went to college together and served in the same church out there, and it was during those years that I really grew to love and respect him. Uh, God gifted him with such a pastoral heart, even even as a college student, and it's been wonderful to see him grow in his ministry and grow uh, to be able to have more people be ministered through this uh, tender-hearted shepherd and a man who loves God and his word. And so let's welcome Pastor Jung warmly as we get ready to hear the word. Thank you. Thank you for the welcome. Uh, it is a privilege for me to be here. Um, Okay, uh, I, you know, I'm from Chicago. He didn't, I don't know if he said that. I have four kids. Uh, I miss them terribly. Uh, oldest one, you know, I was supposed to go to her graduation. Um, I just came from Osaka for a mission trip, and I have to go back there. But uh, I had scheduled it thinking that she's going to graduate the week before, but if you heard, Chicago was uh, hit with a pretty severe snowstorm this past winter, and so the graduation got moved uh, to this week. And so I had to miss her graduation. I miss her. And then uh, she's 13. Next one is Mordecai. Yeah, really. <laughs> Mordecai. And he's, uh, uh, how old is he? He's 11. Uh, you're recording this, right? <laughs> I'm so bad. And then uh, my third is nine. And then my fourth is seven. I might be a year off on the ages, but it's okay. Uh, God knows I love them. But I, I miss them terribly. And uh, I'm from the Chicagoland area. Uh, die-hard Bulls fan, die-hard Bears fan, die-hard Cubs fan, which means, you know, I know suffering. So, uh, good to be here. All right. Without further ado, let's, uh, uh, let's pray first, and then we'll read this passage. Father, we thank you and praise you for this time. You're just so good. Your grace is massive. There's no other way to explain it. It's, it's just massive. It's huge. It's crazy. It's deep. So we thank you for the grace that covers our lives. And even when sometimes we resist, your grace is working for us. Your grace is convincing us, sanctifying us, growing us into your image. We are so thankful. And as we gather here together, and as we sit under the teaching of your word, we pray that you would speak, our hearts would hear, and then our lives, with our lives, we would respond. Do something that we cannot do for ourselves. Transform our hearts and move us into obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew chapter 1. Or if you have it on your phones, please turn on your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. I thought about the most exciting passage I can preach on here as a guest speaker, and I landed on the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. And Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram. And Ram, the father of, of Aminadab, and Aminadab, the father of Nashon. And Nashon, the father of Salman. And Salman, the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David, the king. So that's the first section of the genealogy. Second section. 
And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph. And Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah. And Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah. And Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation of Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Sheltiel, and Sheltiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David, that's the first section, were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, second section, 14 generations. And then the last section, from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. I don't know if you know Kanye West. He is, according to Wikipedia, an American rapper, songwriter, record producer, entrepreneur, and fashion designer. But did you know that Kanye West, Mr. West, is the son, he is a son of an English professor. Um, however, he is proudly a self-proclaimed, and actually there's a picture of him on the next slide, if you can put it up in case you don't know who he is. Maybe you'll recognize his face. He is a proudly self-proclaimed non-reader. Listen to his quote. Mr. West says, I am not a fan of books. I am a proud non-reader of books. I like to get information from like doing stuff, like actually talking to people and actually living real life. Uh, but you know, did you know that Mr. West has written a 52-page book full of his sayings, shall we say Kanye-isms? Some pages are blank, and others contain profound statements like, I hate the word hate. Get used to being used. Now, I'm not making fun of the book, or Mr. West, or the people who buy them. Maybe a little bit. But I'm just pointing out the irony. There's, there's sort of this irony here that I'm not a fan of books, but buy mine for $9.99 on Amazon, or whatever it costs. It's hard to ignore the implication. My story is important enough, surely, that you should plop down some money to get it. But you know, as far as your story, as far as other books, it's okay, I'll pass, because I want to live life and find out about life ourselves. But when we think about what he is saying, it is really emblematic of the things that we think in our generation. What do I mean? I think in our generation, at least living in the States, it has become abundantly clear to me that there is this sort of loss of the meta-narrative. Meta-narrative meaning the big story the big story that gives meaning to all of our stories. Instead, we've become obsessed with the micro-narrative or the mini-narrative. So we write our blogs and update our Facebooks and send out our tweets. And we want to express ourselves and we want to Instagram about what we're going through. But all of that really doesn't make much sense at the end of the day if you and I don't understand the great biblical meta-narrative, the sweeping redemption story. And that's what the Bible says. The Bible says the greatest story in history is his story. In other words, redemptive story. The storyline of Jesus. Not my story, not your story, but the story of Jesus. We must understand his story as written in the scriptures. The Bible also says that your story and my story will only make sense in the context of his story. If we try to understand our lives apart from his story, we'll be frustrated, empty, lost, because life really doesn't make sense 
apart from redemptive history. But the encouraging thing that the Bible also says is your story and my story can be part of his story if we repent and put our faith in Christ, who forgives us and then empowers us for redemptive story. Here, Matthew is sort of doing that. He is beginning this new story, the first book of the New Testament. And Matthew, formerly a tax collector, is writing from his heart about the story of Jesus. And why does he begin with the genealogy? Because he is summarizing the Old Testament before he starts the story of the New Testament. That's why. He's summarizing the Old Testament for us to tell us that Jesus didn't appear in a vacuum. But there is a backstory here. Jesus is, the, is a fulfillment of the prophecies. And all the words and all the kings and all the prophets and all the priests pointed forward to this great king, Jesus, who would come and rescue humanity. So we'll talk about three things today. First, we'll talk about God's story via Matthew, via the book of Matthew. Verse 1 tells us a lot. Nearly every word in this verse is critical. Look at, look at verse 1 with me, would you? The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Every word is pretty critical. First of all, we notice it's a book. It's a book. It's a book of what? It's filled with not Kanye-isms, but Jesus-isms. Stories, the life, the ministry, the teachings of Jesus. But we also call it narrative theology, meaning, meaning Matthew has intentionally collected a series of narrative stories, narrative accounts of Jesus' life, intentionally selecting certain stories from a certain perspective to teach us something about Jesus as he writes specifically to a certain audience, right? Because you have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you would think, why don't you just all collaborate and write one book? The Bible is big enough. But they all insist on writing their own Gospel. Why? Because they are all punctuating a different, unique perspective of who Jesus is. For example, in Luke, he is writing to the Gentiles. Therefore, when he writes his genealogy, it tracks all the way back, not to Abraham, like Matthew did, but to Adam, the first man. However, Matthew is writing to the Jews. Therefore, he tracks his genealogy back to who? Abraham. Why? Because Abraham was the first Jew the father of Israel, Father Abraham. Matthew and Luke are both writing about the same Jesus, but to different audiences and different focus in mind. So it's a book, a very specific book. But it's also a book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The word genealogy there is not, it doesn't say the book containing the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It says the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Genealogy, the word there, is the Greek word Genesis, which, of course, is the first book of the Bible, which means beginnings or origins. I think what Matthew is getting at is this. If Genesis is a story of creation, then Matthew is a story of recreation. If Genesis is a story of creation, which has gone bad, and Mark really emphasizes this, where the paradise became a wilderness, so that by the time Jesus comes on the scene, the paradise is no longer paradise, but it's a wilderness, and so Jesus has to restore that wilderness back to paradise. If Genesis is creation, Matthew is recreation. Why? Because Jesus is going to make all things new. To prove this, we can do a little quick survey on things that Matthew samples for us. First of all, he mentions Herod, who persecuted by murdering all the baby boys, right? Because he was afraid that the king Jesus would overtake his government and all that kind of stuff. So he was paranoid, and he kills all the baby boys. There's uh, persecution. But what did Israel go through? Do you remember? Israel was persecuted by Pharaoh. Do you see what's happening here? Matthew is saying, listen, you're Jews, and I'm writing to you, and I'm telling you that the Israelites were the chosen people of God. You were the chosen people of God, and, and God wanted to use you. But because of sin, in your history, you see... God's grace, but you also see a series of failures. 
And I'm going to show you by the way that I arrange my writing that Jesus is going to recapitulate the history of Israel, but he's going to succeed. So they have the same persecutors. But Moses was rescued to be the deliverer of God's people. Jesus was also rescued early on in the book of Matthew by the warning of an angel to Joseph in the dream, and Jesus escaped to Egypt. We also see that the Israelites, in their history, according to 1 Corinthians 10, were baptized through the Red Sea. And we also see Jesus identifying with sinners by being baptized in the Jordan River. And what happens after Jesus is baptized? God the Father says, Matthew 3.17, This is my beloved Son. So there's affirmation of His Sonship. And then the Israelites, in Exodus 4.22, it says, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. So there's affirmation. After the baptism, what happens? Israelites are led into the wilderness for 40 years where they travel around. Why? Because Deuteronomy 8.2 says, so that God may test you to know what was in your heart. And of course, it was grumbling in their hearts. But Jesus is in the wilderness too, right after he gets baptized. Not for 40 years, but 40 days while fasting. But here comes the difference. The Israelites grumbled in the wilderness after their exodus. Jesus does not grumble, but rather answers Satan's temptation by saying, The word of God says, for it is written. We see what Israel should have been. Israel should have been like Jesus, the true Israel who hung on God's word and fought the evil one with the truth of God and the spirit of God. Third, I know you're very discouraged because it's the first point. I'm still on the sub point of a first point. Do not be discouraged. We just have to lay the foundation here. All right? Third, it'll get much faster. I don't know if it'll get better, but it'll get faster. Third, it is a book about the Messiah. How do we see this? The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. These three titles summarize Matthew's view of Jesus. Son of Abraham connects Jesus ethnically to the father of the Jews. Son of David connects Jesus royally, that he's in the line, the lineage of the throne of David, that was promised to David, 2 Samuel 7, 16, your throne will last forever. And of course, it comes to its apex culmination in Jesus Christ. And then lastly, it is Jesus is not only covenant father, covenant king, but we see covenant Messiah. Jesus is the anointed one that was the ultimate fulfillment of all the anointed people in the Old Testament, prophet, priest, and king. So putting in all that together, the theme of Matthew is to show us that Jesus is the Messiah sent to bring the kingdom of God to the entire world. And then lastly, it's a book written by Matthew. Matthew, who was a disciple of Jesus, who was a former tax collector. He left everything to follow Jesus. Tradition says that Matthew used to have a pencil behind his ear all the time. And whenever Jesus said something remarkable, he would jot it down. So this means that the book of Matthew is not just a bunch of theological ramblings but rather it's a testimony from a man's heart who wants to desperately show us who Jesus is. We must have ears to listen. There's a great famous preacher. He's such a famous preacher, they call him the Prince of Preachers. His name was C.H. Spurgeon. And C.H. Spurgeon, when they invited him to be the pastor, he said, I'm just a poor farm boy. I, I, I think you have the wrong man. <laughs> I can't be your pastor. And it was a real famous church that had asked him. And so uh, he, he was fighting it. And then finally they said, no, you're the right man. We want you. Uh, because his reputation had preceded him. And they got him. And his church started to just burst at the seams because of the power of God and what a great preacher he was. So what happened was the church grew and grew and grew. And I mean, the building couldn't contain him anymore. So they went to Siri, uh, uh, Siri Hall and they were just checking the sound. And Spurgeon, he walked up to the stage right here, and you know, back then they didn't have like amplification like mic system, but they wanted to check the, the sound quality. So this is what he did. Spurgeon stood up by himself, and he said, 
Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Who does a mic check like that? Right? I would have probably done testing, testing. He goes, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Well, a couple of minutes later, a man walked into the hall. His face was ashen white. Spurgeon said, Sir, what is wrong? The guy said, Sir, I just heard the voice of God. <laughs> Spurgeon said, Oh, really? What did God say? God said in a thundering voice, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Spurgeon looked at him. He said, Sir, that was the voice of God to you. And he accepted Christ on the spot. Before he had his first church service, he had a convert. <laughs> now, I thought about that. I thought, what an amazing thing it was that during the mic check, or not mic check, but acoustic check, that's what came out of his mouth. That meant if he was sleeping and I kicked him, he would have, behold, the Lamb of God. What? You see what I mean? It was inside of him. The word of God was so internalized in him that it was instinctive that that should come out of his mouth. Second thing I thought of was, wow, what an arrogant thing to say. That was the voice of God to you. Like, are you God? No, that's faith. He believed that God can use his word to speak to anyone at any time in his sovereign will. All he knew was he spoke the word of God but it wasn't like he was changing that man, that worker who was working on the roof and heard, Behold the Lamb of God. He just trusted, I'm speaking God's word, and that is God's word for you, sir. You see, as we look at the book of Matthew, as we look at the story of God, it is not enough, it is never enough just to know the Bible. Because demons had knowledge without faith and without love. Rather, we must look at God's story with faith. That is the word of God to me. And it must be such the word of God to me that it's instinctive that when I speak, it comes out. God's story. God's story. Second, God is faithful to his story. So we see three sections, 14 generation, 14 generation, 14 generation. First section is Abraham to King David, King David to exile, exile to Messiah. What is, David, what is Matthew doing? Matthew is basically categorizing into three sections a way to understand the history of Israel. Abraham to King David, I would say, is promise fulfilled because Abraham was given the promise of the seed and the land. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Season two is King David to exile, and it is what I would call future hope. Because even though people are exiled, there was future hope. God was going to bring a Messiah, even though they were exiled into foreign land because of sin. So promise fulfilled, season one. Season two, future hope. Season three was exile to the Messiah, and I would call that faithfulness displayed. Faithfulness displayed. Why? Because the Messiah is here. Mathematical formula. 14 generation plus 14 generation plus 14 generation equals one person. Jesus Christ. You see, this genealogy is not just a list of names. It is a record of God's grace. And I thought about this. I thought, what's a good way to picture this redemptive history? I thought of it like this. Dominoes. Not domino pizza, but dominoes. The trick with dominoes is you gotta knock down the first one. You gotta arrange it in a way, and then you knock down the first one, and then you just let it be, right? So, here, a little sound effect. Duh. <laughs> or, ping, whatever the, the thing sounds like. Boop. And then, right? Da, 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 da. That's, I'm not exactly sure if that's what dominoes sound like, but that's what it's going to sound like for this sermon. 
That is redemptive history. What do I mean? Adam and Eve, Genesis 1, created in beautiful paradise. You can eat anything you want. Anything but that forbidden fruit. Uh, I think I'll eat the forbidden fruit. Beautiful garden. No sin. Now sin enters. And then what? First domino effect. Boom. Adam and Eve have children. Cain and Abel. Of course, it's a story of the first fresh side, first murder. Cain gets jealous of Abel. I don't know what the deal's going on, but Cain and Abel. Cain brutally murders his brother in the, in the field. And God says, don't you know, your brother's blood is screaming to me from the ground. Adam and Eve, boom. Da, 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 da. Cain and Abel, boom. Da, 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 da. Now we come to a righteous man of faith. Oh, maybe with Noah, it'll be fine. He heard the voice of God when everybody else was not listening. He built the ark even when everyone was laughing. Flood comes. Noah survives. This righteous, godly man, Noah. But then in Genesis 9, Noah gets drunk with some home-brewed liquor. He strips naked and he falls asleep. Not your best picture of a godly man. Adam and Eve, boom. Cain and Abel, boom. Da 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 da. Noah, boom. Da 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 da. We get to David. Wow, David, man after God's own heart. And yet, after he defeats Goliath, after he is anointed, after Saul passes and David rises to the throne, gets the Davidic covenant, and then he goes up on the roof. And then he sees a woman. And I have no idea why she's naked on the roof, bathing. But she is. He looks at her. He lusts after her and says, get her. Uh, servant goes, oh, that's Uriah, the Hittite's wife, the guy who's fighting for you. He goes, no, 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 get her for me. He gets her. They stay up all night playing cards. <laughs> and then she gets pregnant because that's what happens when you play cards. And then he kills her husband. He takes her as one of his wives. Adultery, murder, man after God's own heart. Adam and Eve, boom. Ba da 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 da, boom. Noah, da 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 da, David, boom. Da 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 da. This is the history of Israel. Da 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 da. And you get to Matthew, and the dominoes are falling furiously. And then Jesus is there, and then da 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 da. Da 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 da. Jesus is the first domino that doesn't fall because Jesus is the sin stopper. He stops sin. But not only does he stop sin, he absorbs sin on the cross. He absorbs sin. But that's not all that he does. Da, 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 da. He absorbs sin and then, look. You gotta look. Boom! Ba, da, 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 da. And he makes the domino stand back up. Why? Because he's reversing the curse of the Garden of Eden. That's why you see him teaching, right? You see him teaching. Why? Because he's got to correct and fix people's thinking. You see him healing. Why? Because he's showing a picture of the restoration of our body that we're damaged by sin and is going to die. You see him casting out demons. Why? Because he's showing people who's the real king. Yeah, demons are flying around now and they're the prince of the air. But I'm the true king, and I'm giving you a glimpse of that day when they'll be casted forever. And ultimately, he dies on the cross. Why? Because he's showing them that spiritually, you will no longer be dead, but you will come alive. Boom! Ba -da 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 -da. All the dominoes stand back up. But that's not it. Mm, there's one more coming. He stands, he stands them all back up, and then he gives them another little tap. Boom! And then the dominoes go. Africa, Asia, America, Latin America. Because the fallen dominoes become the standing dominoes, which become now the sent dominoes. 
What is God doing? Jesus is saying, I'm going to use you. You who were once dead in sin, by grace, by the cross, you're going to come alive spiritually, you're going to change, and I'm going to use you. I'm gonna, you are sent people. You're not just redeemed, come alive spiritually, but when you're alive spiritually, you are sent to picture Jesus to this world. A couple of verses that really talk about the infallibility of God's sovereign promises coming to fruition. Joshua 21, 45, not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. I love that. All, not one word had failed. All came to pass. And then Matthew 16, 18, I, Jesus, will, certainty, not possibility, build. It will take time. My, God's, not mine, church, the bride of Jesus Christ. God will do it. it the, the fulfillment of redemptive history is not dependent on us. God will bring it. To fulfillment. When we're in college, you know, we, we both Pastor Nettie and I went to, and Pastor Joel and, and Pastor Michael, we all went to this church called the Covenant Fellowship. And you know, Pastor Eddie and I were near nearer to age than you know in our age than the other guys. When we were there, um, it was the beginning of uh, Covenant Fellowship at CFC, and uh, it was mostly Korean American. Mostly now it's like over twenty maybe over 30 ethnic groups, but back then it was mostly Korean Americans. And there was this time when, little bit by little, other nationalities would trickle in, like in clusters. And the first such group was Filipino Americans. I don't know how many of you are Filipino American here, but Filipino Americans, and they uh, had a Catholic background, so it was very difficult for them to come to a Protestant church. And uh, families didn't like it very much. But anyway, they started coming, and I, I told this story in the previous, uh, you know, service, but I just found out that Pastor Eddie was the one who witnessed to, the, to this guy who, uh, I'm sure he didn't want me to say it, but I said it anyway, but he was the guy that was uh, one of the leaders of that group. Anyway, there were about like six or seven of them, and they came to the service, and they all sat in the back. Right? They started coming, being interested in spiritual things, and you know, they, they said, we're going to just listen to the message, and we're going to go, because this is like weird. They're too emotional. And... So, the pastor preached, and after the pastor preached, I guess the Holy Spirit was just working on their hearts. So when he said, let's pray, they were all like crying. Do you ever do that? Like when you get blessed, you try to cry only during the prayer time, and then you, what? okay, maybe it's just me. But anyway, so that's what they were doing. They were trying to wipe off the tears, a bunch of guys. Sermon was over, and they started to sing, and they were getting really blessed, you know, really blessed. And afterwards, they said it was so uncomfortable walking home. Because they were like, they just came just to check it out, and they all ended up crying like little babies. And one of them said, dang, he got me good. <laughs> that preacher got me good. I mean, they were young Christians, and they, you know, that was their way of saying God really touched them. So they started to grow. They went to small group. And what happened was, late at night, they would study together, and they would get pizza. As all college students do, they would get pizza. And then they had a prayer rotation of who would pray for the pizza that night. The reason was, so they would pray, whoever it was. Hey, you know, Reggie, pray. And Reggie would pray, dear God, blah, 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 blah. And amen. And as they were eating pizza, taking a study break, they would evaluate his prayer. Oh, yeah, that, that was pretty good. Oh, Reggie, that sounded bad. <laughs> Don't say that again. Why? Because they're new Christians, and they were joining small group, and they were so scared that they were going to get called on to pray for the meal. So they were practicing how to pray in public. So cute, right? Their hearts were so pure. They were really starting to get blessed. We had a praise night later that year. Praise night, you know, skits, songs. But it was pretty tame back then, meaning most outrageous act was probably like a skit and a song together or something like that. But these guys came out, and they signed up for praise night. And we were all curious what they were going to do. Stepped onto the stage. Curtain opened. The guy, one guy, had a big clock on his neck, going old school, Flavor Flav. And they started to dance. We're like, oh my gosh, what are they doing? Are they allowed to do that in church? And they're good dancers, all right? Because that, that was their past, right? They partied a lot. And they had, I think Filipinos might be one of the best, 
you know, they have among Asians best dancers. The Koreans are good too, but you know, anyway, so they were dancing like crazy back then anyway, back then. So they were dancing and dancing and it was like kind of weird, you know, like they're just dancing. It wasn't even Christian music. They're just dancing like crazy. And then everything changed. Toward the second half of their dancing, they just started in syncopated rhythm, started like shouting at the top of their lungs while they're dancing. Praise God for what he's done in our lives. Praise God for what he's done in our lives. I, I can't lie to you. I think that was the first time I saw people dancing and I got choked up. <laughs> Such purity of heart. With no shame. Just declaring the only way they knew how. God saved us. Listen. Even if we strategically try to reach out to Filipino Americans, I bet you we couldn't have done half of that. That is nothing but the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the one who writes redemptive history. And Matthew is saying when you read this genealogy, please don't read it as a record of names, but read it as a record of God's grace. What God did in all these generations. Third, I think it's very appropriate today is Vision Sunday because we'll end with this. God's story is for the nations. God's story is for the nations. We'll see it through five women and one man. Five women, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, Mary. Tamar pretended to be a prostitute, got impregnated by her father-in-law, and yet she is in the line of Jesus. Rahab, she didn't pretend to be a prostitute because she was a prostitute. Jericho, yet she had faith, and she becomes David's great-great-grandmother. Third, there's Ruth, who is a Moabitess, and everything about Ruth's story drips with the sweet and kind grace of God. Fourth, there's Bathsheba, who was identified as the wife of Uriah, who was a Hittite, and by her marriage with him, she was a foreigner as well. And then, of course, fifthly, we have Mary, poor, simple virgin, unmarried, teenage girl. This is the lineage of Jesus. It is not filled with impressive people. And it was a shock to the Jews who read this. What? Jesus has Moabitess blood? What? Jesus has Jericho blood? What? What is this? It's grace is what it is. It's massive grace. As one pastor says, if he had called sinners by grace to be his forefathers, should we be surprised when he calls them by grace to be his descendants? Grace! Grace! Amazing grace! Do you ever feel like you don't fit in anywhere? That you're a misfit? Remember, there is a place you will always fit in his hand and in his heart. Misfits fit perfectly into God's redemption story. Why? Because of massive grace. But not only five old women, or five foreign women, or five, four foreign women and one teenage unwed mother, but one old man, Abraham. Verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And this is significant because Abraham was the father of faith, right? He believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. Genesis says he had faith. And then God says, you will have many descendants in Genesis 12. And it says, all the families of the earth, Genesis 12, 3, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Meaning the global glory of God will, be, will take place through your descendants. His glory will fill the earth, not just Israel, but the earth. His impact will be global. So who are the descendants of Abraham? Galatians 3, 7 and 8. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Matthew was saying, you're not descendants of Abraham because you have his race, but because you both have the same grace. That means you and I, even though we're not Jewish, we are spiritual Israelites. We are descendants of Abraham. And what are we called to do? We are called to go to the ends of the earth 
and fill this earth with what? His global glory. Make Jesus look beautiful to all the people in the world. You know, I think it's so important as we look at redemptive story and how we're part of this, to look at it like this. You know, I was doing some gardening, well, not really gardening, I was watering my backyard. And I took the hose and I, you know, dragged the hose and I was watering my backyard, my grass. But my backyard, you know, there's little more to cover and I knew that I had to screw on another hose to this hose, right? So, but the problem is I already had the water going, but I'm so lazy that I just took the hose and I tried to put it on. And what happens when you try to put on a hose to another hose when the water's going? What's going to splash your face? Make you look like an idiot. So I tried it really fast. I thought if I used my ninja skills that it would be possible, yet it was not possible. So I ran to the faucet. I turned off the water. I came back and I put it on and then it, I didn't put it on right so the water was squirting again. So I took it off and then I knew I had to go turn it off, but again, I wanted to check my ninja skills. I did it and again, I got splashed in the face, felt like an idiot, went back turned off the water, came back, screwed it on, went back, turned on the water, and now it was flowing. So I was thinking about that. I was meditating on it as I was walk, watching, not watching, but I was thinking what I just did. So here we are in high school. Here we are in college. Here we are in, you know, grad school. Here we are, young adult life, working professional. So what happens is, Redemptive history is going to flow. Okay? God's not going to stop. Redemptive history flow. It's flowing like a river. But if you don't prepare while you're in college for your young adult life, right? I mean, you hear college students saying this, I'm so busy. You're not busy. Trust me, you're not busy. And when you hear newly married people saying, oh, so busy, you're not. You're not. Right? And you know, it goes on and on. If you have one kid, talk to someone who has two kids. Right? Two kids, at least it's man-to-man -man defense. You go three, you got to play zone. Right? <laughs> and then four and five, you know, it's like game over, right? Just, ah, uh, take my life, Lord. <laughs> Meaning, life just gets more complicated. When you get married, you, I was talking to Pastor Matt before this, how he's really, you know, it was a real blessing. He was just kind of sharing with me about one of the blessings of marriage is learning to think about other people, think about his wife all the time, and you can tell he truly loves her, and it's just blessing. But it is more complication. If I want to do something when I'm single, I'll do it, and that's just me. If I die, I die. I, mean, I don't want to die, but if I die, it's just me. If I die right now, I'm going to leave four kids fatherless and a wife husbandless. It gets more complicated. Life gets more complicated. But even though the complexity of life is there, it is there in a way that we can use it for God's glory. Because the more family members you have, then more possible to disciple them and really show the picture of Jesus Christ and so on and so forth. But if you don't get ready during your here stage one for stage two, and then you get to stage two and you realize, oh, I better shape up spiritually. It's like trying to put on the hose while the water is running. Put on the hose before the water runs, if you will. Preparation spiritually is the key to being used in redemptive history. Pray, pray, and pray some more. You must prepare yourself in prayer. Otherwise, like many of the college students that I know who graduate, one person went to Manhattan working as an eye banker. He called me and he says, Pastor Jung, I got the condo I've always wanted in Manhattan. I'm an eye banker working at a nice firm. But you know what my condo is? It's a glorified closet. They work me like a dog. I come home, I change into my other suit, and I go back to work in the next day. And to be honest with you, the last thing on my mind is to go to church. At least he's honest. But I told him this, be careful. Because if you keep going toward your instincts, your fleshly instincts, and not fighting your heart, and preserving your spiritual life, what will happen 
is that that will become your default mode. And one day you'll wake up and look at yourself in the mirror. You'll be 40 years old, and you'll have a nice job, a nice house, nice family, nice kids, and you'll point yourself in the mirror and say, what happened to you? What happened to your first love? No one is going to give you your first love, hand it to you on the plate, and say, there you go. No, it's a spiritual battle. And so the prayer you pray today is so important for the battle you're going to face tomorrow. Connect the hoses. Why? Because it is so important that you prepare so that you can be in the flow of redemptive history and be used by God. God has chosen us by grace. May we drink. May we eat. May we be filled. And then, as we get stronger, may we get his heart and to be used for the glory of God. I pray that will be the blessing upon OEM. Let's pray. Oh, 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 oh,